the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salt again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Good morning. morning. And welcome to this worship service at Antioch Church of the Brethren. Whether you're here in this place or watching later on, we are glad that you are here. It is a joy to be among you today and to be able to worship with our community, our family of faith, knowing that God is present with us in ways that we barely even can sense and imagine. And yet, by faith, we trust that God is here. We listen to the words of Jesus, trusting that God's Spirit moves through those as well. And Jesus says to us, you are salt for the earth. We are salt. I'm not sure... That's always been a familiar idea for me. But Jesus said so, so I'm having to think about it. Jesus means it not as an insult, like the way we might say someone was acting salty. He doesn't really mean it as a compliment, but he means it more as a call. Jesus calls us to be salt, to season the world with salvation. We are called to be like salt for this world, like salt is for so many things that we eat, enhancing the flavor, preserving it over long periods. Salt brings out the best in things that we eat. That's why we use it so often. Brings out the goodness. When we are out in the world, do we bring out the goodness of the things and the people we encounter? Do we preserve what is good? Bring it to the surface. I learned in our book, that many of us have been reading this Lent, Taste and See by Margaret Feinberg, that the word salvation is actually derived from the same Latin root as salt, which is another one of those things I'm trying to wrap my head around. We use that word salvation in so many different ways, and to think that it comes from salty origins So often, salt for me is just that stuff on french fries. But what does that have to do with being saved, being rescued by a good God? Salt is also the origin idea and word for other words we use, like salary. If someone is uh, worth their salt, right? They are paid Uh, in salt in the ancient world. Or the word salad. Think about the role of salt, salt in salad. Jesus calls us to season the world with salvation. To spread it everywhere we go. For everywhere we go, there is the kingdom of God waiting for us to bring it forth. Bring out the flavor of life. We only have two more Sundays in Lent after this one before we come to Easter on April 4th. Two more weeks of our Taste and See series. And I know that this spring brings many happy things that many of us are excited about, not least of which are vaccinations that are allowing folks to come together again after being apart for so long. At the same time, we have to remember those who are still struggling with bad news and difficult situations. 
May we continue to be the salt that brings out the good and reaches out to help those who struggle in every way. And let us remember that religion that truly satisfies is religion of compassion for those who are hungry, for righteousness, for justice, for hope, for community, and for food. I, I want to give a shout out to, to those who are experiencing this worship service later. Uh, may God bless your viewing, and we pray that things are well with you, and let us know if there are ways that Antioch can be of support. I want to let everyone know that as we approach Holy Week, know that on April 2nd, that will be Good Friday, the Friday before Easter, at 8 p.m., there will be a special service to recognize that day and the events of Jesus' crucifixion, final hours, up at Summit View Park, which is uh, the new park by Germantown Brick Church of the Brethren. It'll be an outdoor service. Several brethren pastors in our area, including myself, are working to put together a service of darkness. That's why it might seem late, 8 p.m., outside under the pavilion. And we are looking for some greeters, some ushers, and some other volunteers uh, to help prepare the space and to direct people uh, once the service is about to begin. So if you're willing to help out, please let me know. Otherwise, mark it down on your calendars as a way to recognize that special Holy Week, uh, since it is uh, so different this year. This is an opportunity to celebrate. Are there other announcements that you would like to share or lift up or joys or concerns? Lynn? As Andy said, uh, spring is a time of celebration. If you haven't figured it out by now, Andy grows facial hair every year at Lent. So with the arrival of Easter, we will have much to celebrate. <laughs> Roll away the stone. <laughs> but we want to remember another celebration today, an anniversary, and a lot of times we think about many years of something to celebrate. This is only four years. If I'm not mistaken, four years ago today, Andy became our pastor and presented his first sermon here. Um, we are blessed that he has put up with us that long and vice versa. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Andy. And thank you. It's been a good four years. Other announcements or joys or concerns? Requests for prayer. We are continuing to put out a weekly newsletter with some names and concerns to be lifting up in your own personal prayers. I hope that you are doing that in whatever way is natural uh, and uh, connects you to God. If there's no other items to share, would you join me now in prayer? God, we give you so much thanks today for the warm weather that brings to life not only the created world around us, but our spirits, our energy, our joy. We give you thanks for this space and this community, these people that we love and have grown together with. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to immerse ourselves in praise, to grow and learn and seek you. We thank you for the table of grace that you set for us daily with just what we need if we are willing to receive it, our daily bread. Not only the physical things, but love and support. 
relationships. Lord, we thank you for being here now, for breathing life into us once again. Forgive this morning our distractions and those things that linger in our minds. Give us a clean slate so that we might have a renewed purpose to be salt in your world. Be present now at this table of worship that we may sing together and pray together and seek you as one and come away satisfied and ready to serve. In the name of Christ Jesus, the Lord of the banquet. Amen. Please stand for our call to worship, our opening hymn, and our invocation prayer. During Lent, we focus on becoming the salt of the earth by following Jesus. We pray, fast, and give of ourselves. From the dawn of time, salt has been used as a seasoning, a preservative, and a link to the spirit world. Ancient people knew the amazing healing power of salt and traded it ounce for ounce with gold. Salt is a symbol of hospitality. A covenant of salt is an insoluble alliance between friends. Bread and salt create a binding commitment. Salt of the earth suggests trustworthiness, wisdom, stability, and strength. Salt purifies. Let us ask God to help us to make good choices. And join in with our opening hymn, You Are the Salt of the Earth.
Let us pray. Lord, you call your friends salt of the earth. We are your friends. Our lives are seasoned with your presence. We share our love of you with others. We help heal the world with friendship and we light the world with your love. We pray that in this season of Lent, we grow in your friendship and be salt of the earth people, happy in your love. With this in mind, be salty and illuminate it for God's glory in the world, however you are best called to be. Amen. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, thank you that we are our portion, our inheritance, and our great reward. Help us to serve with love according to our gifts so that we will be salt of the earth and your light in the world. May we persevere, our, preserve our faith, and shine brightly as your children. Help us to give willingly and cheerfully make our offering to you, knowing that all that we have come from you. You can give your offering here today or through our Tidely app or mail it to the church. And now join in with our hymn, Be Present at Our Table. I think our second scripture passage today needs a little setup. It comes from the book of Numbers, which is only the fourth book of the Bible. Numbers is all about the wanderings of the people of Israel after escaping slavery in Egypt, preparing themselves to enter the promised land of Canaan. And part of this preparation involved the details of sorting out in advance who will get what piece of land and how much? The people of Israel were divided into tribes. How many tribes? Twelve, twelve tribes, twelve family groupings. And God prepared instructions for which parcel of land each particular tribe would get to inherit and settle as their own, which was a very good thing because it would prevent them all from just barreling in and beginning to do what all descendants of brothers do, start fighting over who gets what and how much. No fighting. God's already done the work. He's laid out the map. All 12 tribes get a land to call their own. Like you might think of it related to states in a nation. All 12 tribes... That is, except for one. Uh, any guesses which tribe is the exception? Levi. Poor Levi. The Levites did not receive an inheritance of land. God was very clear that he had a different sort of inheritance to bestow upon them. The Levites were called to be set apart from their brothers with a special purpose, a special role to play among all of the other tribes. The Levites were in charge of all of the religious customs and rituals, 
all the sacrifices and festivals required by God. The Levites were religious workers. And as such, they needed to be dispersed somewhat amongst all the other tribes. They couldn't have their own particular state because then they'd be far too removed from where they needed to do their work. This was somewhat of a precarious place for the Levites, scattered, not unified together in strength like the other tribes, right? And from time to time, as the biblical story progresses, various tribes will do things on their own, like form their own little independent armies. The Levites couldn't do this. They were divided, scattered. They would not have access to as much of the rich farmland and fields to provide for themselves. So God makes a special promise with just the Levite tribe, a covenant promise, a binding spiritual agreement. And God ensures that all the other tribes need to know about this special covenant. God declares that portions of all of the offering, offerings <coughs> the other tribes bring to sacrifice to God will be set aside to meet the needs of of these Levites, these religious working minorities. Part of the offerings people made to God would go to them. And this is part of that longer covenant promise passage in Numbers that you can read on the wall. Numbers 18, verse 19. Whatever is set aside from the holy offerings the Israelites present to the Lord, I give to you and your sons and daughters as your perpetual share. It is an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord for both you and your offspring. This is God's promise to always provide for the Levites. She says, I give to you, right? That's God's voice. She doesn't command the other tribes to give extra. Rather, it's out of God's own generosity, God's own share that he provides for the religious workers. And when God makes a promise, we're supposed to, of course, trust it. But it also meant that if I were a Levite, I would have to have quite a bit of trust in the other tribes to be faithful in presenting their offerings. Nonetheless, God promises to look after them just as he promised to watch over all his people and still does. God says it's their perpetual share in the inheritance. Perpetual means always and forever. No one can take it away. An everlasting covenant of salt. And of course you're going, oh, that's how it ties into today's theme, right? I was waiting for that. What is a promise of salt? Not to be confused with the modern expression of taking something with a grain of salt. You heard that? Which usually means it may or may not be true. Don't put too much stock or weight on it. In this case, we have the opposite. In this case, we remember that salt was the primary tool of preserving food. And in that arid, hot climate, preservation was critical. So if a promise included salt, it was a symbol of preservation and permanence. And in fact, in other sacrificial offerings, salt was added to the offering of grain or meat as an additional symbol that this would last forever. This sacrifice has eternal weight. It would have consequences that go on and on long after it is offered. This is a trustworthy offering. And nobody is going back on their word. So fast forward in time a few millennia and 
how do we symbolize our trustworthiness to one another? We sign documents in ink, right? We offer collateral. But for non-legal promises, trust is a hard thing. God still offers us a promise of perpetual love and faithfulness, but we are not used to such promises without paperwork and signatures, without attorneys and banks getting involved. Imagine making a life-altering promise with only a salty handshake. And you're to trust that. And then remember how many times we have failed to follow through with our promises to God. Remember the vows that we make at our baptism. or in our marriages, or when we dedicate a child. And then remember that God has always remained faithful to us in spite of our own constant failures. There's a new phrase that you've probably heard about in the news. I've been hearing about it for at least a decade on uh, nerdy social media, cancel culture. Is that familiar to you now? It started as a term on social media for when individuals or larger companies are shunned or ostracized for perceived social or moral failings. And in truth, human societies have engaged in some version of this since the very first celebrity in ancient history made a mistake and people didn't like it. Right? But today, it's grown and become more complicated, and certainly the Internet has not uh, helped necessarily with that. But what I'm struck with when I consider God's salty promises is that God doesn't cancel people. Not entirely. God does require that people face the consequences for their actions. God does require that decisions have results that we may not like. Mistakes need to be atoned for. God calls people to continually change and repent of sin, of self-centered action, attitudes that harm others. But God's salt promise, not just to the Levites, but to all the people, is to perpetually surround each one of us with love. And that when we are not faithful, God is faithful. And that promise remains as firm today as on day one. Sometimes I wish that I could be as consistently loving and faithful as that. Right? Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I wish I could cast things away, people, not have to deal with them anymore. But the more I think about it, the more I think about Jesus, the more I grow to love Jesus, the more I realize that's not what I truly want. I want relationships to work. I want them to last. I want them to be faithful. I want them to be full of love. And that's actually what God keeps calling us to be and do, to be salt for the earth. A people who continually bring out the best in each other. Preserving the good, bringing life and 
love faithfully. We are to be a people who don't cancel so much as encourage. Jesus asks, if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And I remember being little and wondering, is this a chemistry question? Right? Is there some equation for how to restore salty flavor to salt? And, and the answer is, well, no. The point is that you can't do it. Right? The only way, though, salt loses its saltiness is if it's overpowered by other flavors or influences. If we want our salty, Jesus-y goodness to have any influence in our world, it's got to be stronger than whatever other forces or flavors are out there. And of course, salt is strongest when it's together. Right? One grain of salt has a taste. But a spoonful can really make a difference. I recently read an article about the difference between chasing Jesus and following Jesus. Think about, think about those words. Chasing and following. It described how many of us chase after Jesus to get a big helping a big dose, and then we, we rest and we sit around after receiving our big portion. We do our own thing, and then we start to wake up and we realize how far Jesus has gotten ahead of us, so we bolt off and chase after him again and repeat over and over. Unlike chasing Jesus, following Jesus, is simpler, but not easier. It means slow, patient steadiness in walking in Jesus' footsteps, at Jesus' pace, doing what he does, going where he goes. In following, we learn the rhythm and the patterns of Jesus, so that over time they become like a second nature to us, learned, regular, a new normal habit. Following is less about getting a big nose full of Jesus once in a while, and more about the day-to-day little things, little acts of love and encouragement, you know, those salty things. Deeper reflection and thoughtfulness on a regular basis. Asking ourselves, what about Jesus' character makes us want to follow him? You ask yourselves, ask yourselves that. What is it about Jesus that makes us want to follow him? Jesus' life was so salty, it couldn't help but affect every other life around him. Sometimes they liked it and sometimes they didn't. But there was influence there nonetheless. He infused each word and step and breath and action with loving faithfulness. And that is something that I want to be like. But I know that I'm a work in progress. How about you? We're all like dishes on the stove that are not quite at the right level of saltiness. And God keeps tasting and adding more if we are ready to become the salty people we are called to be. Do you remember the the WWJD movement. Do you remember that? It was kind of a religious fad for a little bit, right? And kind of 20 years ago, which seems crazy. I had, I had a little necklace thing that said WWJD in high school for like a year, right? 
And, and what did WWJD mean? What would Jesus do? And it was just kind of this question that we were to be saturated with and applying to various situations in our lives. Oh, what would Jesus do in this situation? What would Jesus do? And what, as if to say, okay, well, if Jesus would do it, shouldn't I be doing it? Right? And it's a question that shouldn't really get old unless we let it. But I've also begun to realize that for some of us, the question may be harder than it appears at first glance. In order to know what Jesus would do, we have to actually know what Jesus did do, don't we? There's no need to guess. We can look it up. We can read the Gospels. We can saturate our lives in learning about the life that he lived. And that's part of that following, right? To step in the footsteps of Jesus consistently and steadily, we have to see where he has already stepped and trod. There was a relevant article this past year, and when I say relevant, I mean it was published by Relevant Magazine, not just that it was relevant, but um, the writer was sharing about hearing a particular worship song, and it led with the words, where you go, I'll go, do you remember that? Where you stay, I'll stay, and uh, the writer says that he was, he was captivated just by those lines, and he says... It was revelatory to think of living my life in complete unity and relationship with God the Father like Jesus did. As a Christian, I knew that the goal was to be like Jesus and do what he did, but it always felt passive that eventually one day I'll just start to look and walk and talk like Jesus as if it was by osmosis alone, apart from any action other than saying, I'm a Christian. The part I missed at the time, he says, and so often miss even now, is the aspect of action. Where he goes, I also must go. What he says, I also must say. The poetic nature of these words doesn't come to life through a passive thought process. If I think it enough, it becomes true. What if... Or what would it sound like if instead those words sang, where you go, I think about going. Or what you say, I contemplate saying. The ambiguity and soft intention would inspire people to live a transformed life nearly as much as a rock at the bottom of the stream inspires the water to move around it. The words of Christ are not to take up our crosses at some convenient time in the future and follow him when it best fits within our life plan. The time is now for action. And action is the only way to follow Jesus. May our actions reveal the Jesus that we follow. May our lives salt the world with Jesus and his love. And may we live the story that we love to tell. Would you rise for our last hymn, I Love to Tell the Story.
This is God's special purpose for us. We have been set apart like the Levites of old to be salt for the earth. Salt that brings forth the goodness of life for everyone. Salt that preserves in faithfulness what Jesus is doing all around. Salt that flavors the world with love. So, go and love. Amen. Thank you.